Good morning, everyone. I hope um, you're well, uh, I hope you're warm, and uh, welcome to our Economic Outlook seminar for the technology and media sector. We're doing it virtually, obviously, this year, so uh, I've got nothing to tell you about fire alarm announcements. Uh, there have been no capacity issues in the room. You've got a more comfortable chair than usual, and hopefully we'll get through this without any cat filters. Uh, we also get to say the um, phrase of the moment, which is next slide, please, Kathy Ann. So next slide, please. <laughs> so today um, I'm delighted to be hosting um, Rain Newton-Smith, who's the chief economist at the CBI and leads the CBI's work on supporting business and the wider economy through COVID, and also the CBI's work on uh, tackling climate change and a low carbon transaction transition. So uh, two rather <laughs> rather major topics and uh, obviously a very, very busy lady indeed. And we're all looking forward to hearing what she has to say. After Rain has uh, presented her session, uh, two of our um, transactions focused partners um, uh, operating in the tech and media space, Paul and Derek, are going to tell you what they're seeing arising on transactions at the moment and how they're expecting that to develop through 2021. And there's obviously plenty of transactional activity uh, that we're all seeing at the moment. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. And thank you for all of your uh, questions that you've sent in advance. And um, please use the, um, the Q&A function in the black control box uh, at the bottom of your screens to send in further questions. I'll look at them whilst uh, the speakers are talking and we'll add them into the, uh, the questions at the end. Um, so you're all going to be muted throughout and we are recording uh, this webinar. Um, depending on the Q&A, we would expect to finish at about 9.45. It will take five to 10 minutes. So I'm now delighted to hand over to Rain, who's going to talk us through the economic outlook um, for 2021 and potentially beyond. So thanks very much. Over to Rain. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Tony, and, and good morning, everyone. I hope everyone has a good uh, mug of coffee and are staying warm, though I grew up in Canada, so so this sort of cold is, is nothing, and I'm only disappointed it's not been accompanied, at least where I am, by about a foot of snow. Um, uh, but but really what I wanted uh, to do today is, is to sort of take you through uh, where is the UK economy? How are we doing in the midst of all this pandemic? Uh, and reflect as well about uh, how the global economy is doing and, and uh, give some thoughts about the UK outlook in a, in a global context. Uh, I then also wanted to talk um, around you know what's going to stick from this uh from how this pandemic has you know transformed all of our lives uh what will we see are the trends that really hold uh, across the wider economy and and also think uh ahead to some of the opportunities uh, i'm not going to lie there will be bits of of the uh of my presentation that aren't going to be uh, that cheery, but I also want to end uh, thinking a little bit about what the business community is doing uh, to address and tackle climate change, because I think that is one of the biggest uh, changes and transformation that absolutely needs to happen in in our economy. And um, digital adoption is really uh, at the heart of some of that transformation uh, as well. Uh, so with that, I'm also going to uh, channel my uh, best Chris Whitty, uh, and I will ask for next slide, please. Uh, we are going to circulate the slides uh, afterwards, so if you want to go through them uh, in detail, then then do. I just find it's helpful to have uh, some pictures to, to sort of guide the story of what's happening uh, in the economy. Um, so I think, look, first of all, what we do know, and this, this is a bit depressing, I'm afraid, but the UK has seen the biggest hit to uh, its economy relative to uh, many of the other uh, countries. It's, I think, the second worst in the OECD if you're just looking at the contraction in output uh, that we saw last year. Um, and I think in general, what we've seen across countries around the world is, look, I never thought as an economist that I would be uh, presiding over the uh, economy when we would see, uh, you know, such a contraction uh, in, in GDP. But the, the challenge with the pandemic is, of course, it's, it's touched almost every country uh, in the world. 
Um, but there are some real differences in, in how countries uh, have responded. And I think, you know, there's this narrative about a trade off between uh, the health of a nation and uh, the health of the economy. Uh, but to my mind, that's a really, really false a dichotomy. What you can see is actually the countries who have tackled uh, the pandemic well, who have managed to control uh, rising infections, uh, have seen much better outcomes for their economy. Uh, and you can certainly see that in how China has uh, recovered and many countries uh, in Asia have actually absolutely uh, tackled the infection rates and are now seeing their uh, economies uh, recover very strongly. Um, so very strong growth rates in China expected over the course of the next couple of years. Um, the other thing that really has driven some of the, the different experiences uh, uh, in different countries has been the sectoral mix uh, in the economy. In the UK, we're relatively reliant on face-to-face -face, uh, consumer interactions. Uh, basically, it means human interactions, the things that we're all really missing at the moment uh, in the UK. But we have a lot of tourism. Uh, we have a lot of uh, theatres, creative arts, many of the things that rely on, on people being able to interact with others, uh, everything from hairdressers to, to spas, all those consumer services that really depend on human interaction. Uh, the UK, that makes up a relatively larger proportion of our overall uh, spending. So that's definitely been one of the reasons why we've seen um, uh, the UK impacted more than, than some of the others. And of course, it, it then comes back as well to the sort of policy response and what's been done to uh, to, to sort of boost uh, the economy. Uh, and, and we've seen a, an, a massive amount spent by different uh, countries. And actually, the economic response in the UK is seen as being relatively uh, successful. That was uh, what the IMF said so far in their reports uh, back in the autumn. Um, but many countries have spent an, an amazing amount to support their economy and really build that bridge. Because what we do know is that the more businesses that we can save and get through this crisis, uh, the stronger our economy will be uh, as and when we recover. So next slide, please. Uh, so here, this is just showing the impact on mobility. So what has happened to how people move around? Um, and, and I think this actually excludes parks. One of the things that I found really heartening uh, in this pandemic is if you look at how much time people have spent in their local parks or local community and outside uh, in nature, actually that has just gone through uh, the roof and it's probably been a lot for many of us uh, a salvation. But this is just showing that sort of footfall across different countries. Uh, and I just wanted to pick out a few things. First of all, if you take South Korea, this just re-emphasizes the point that countries who have managed to tackle the pandemic, yes, they saw some reduction um, in that sort of first wave in, in travel uh, and how people were moving around, which obviously is important for how people are spending in the economy. Um, but then it, it, it's actually recovered uh, pretty evenly. And there, there's been a few peaks and troughs. Um, and again, in Asia, even in Asia, as we've seen a sort of second wave, we have seen a reduction in, in travel, but it's only been about 10%. So very manageable uh, for the wider economy. And actu actually, interestingly, and this also reflects why uh, the US, despite having a similar sectoral mix uh, to the UK, and also, uh, I would argue, haven't been able to contain infection rates as well as countries in Asia. But actually, uh, the economy and how people have moved around has, stay, has been lower than normal, uh, but stayed relatively uh, static. Whereas you can see in the UK, we saw a big drop in, uh, in mobility. Uh, and then I think the other point to sort of make from the slide is, is if you look to where we are now, we're definitely seeing the second wave and that's not um, not unique to the UK. It's definitely happened in other European countries. And take, for example, Germany, which was re stayed relatively open uh, during that first wave of the pandemic and over the summer. Uh, they've had to tighten restrictions uh, recently as we've seen the second wave uh, grapple across Europe. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is minute, uh, uh, the slides, and you it, it's really more, look, you can get, this is available online. It's the modeling that was done by the University of Warwick and definitely health hazard warning. Uh, this isn't the most optimistic slide, but I think it's important for thinking about how businesses are reacting to the pandemic. And 
at the CBI, I speak to businesses across different sectors, across different regions in the UK on a daily basis. And I think actually what we're seeing is businesses are very pragmatic. Uh, they are looking and preparing for a range of scenarios around how restrictions will be lifted here in the UK uh, and globally. Uh, and I think the reason for that is despite the huge success of the vaccine rollout here in the UK, and it is absolutely a shining beacon uh, of light. And I'll come on to argue in a way uh, we may have lost some of the battle initially around how we tackled uh, the pandemic in, in that first wave. But I am, I'm hopeful and confident that over the long run, we will absolutely win the war on the pandemic. So I think there's a huge issue about the global rollout of vaccines. But here in the UK, we've seen we're the second country in terms of overall vaccination uh, per head, second only to Israel. Uh, and I think the other thing we've managed to do really successfully is be able to update vaccines um, on the basis of new variants uh, and also identify those new variants. Um, and that has really helped us and will help us uh, as this pandemic evolves over the next couple of years. But essentially what this chart is showing is if you think of, if you just look at the charts on the left, it basically says, look, if we uh, get into the cycle of lifting the lockdown too quickly uh, and free up too many restrictions, then we will see yet another wave here in the UK uh, and an impact on uh, not just death, but of course on, on hospitalization. So um, it's really important as we come out and what businesses are saying is they want to come um, out gradually, they want to have a clear line of sight in terms of how different sectors will be able uh, to open up. Uh, but we don't want to get back into this cycle of having to lock down uh, again. So essentially, this says, you know, don't come out of lockdown too early or we'll see uh, a surge in the spring because vaccinations won't um, be able to have reached as, as many. And it really one of the crucial variables here um, is looking at the difference between how much the vaccination uh, uh, reduces infection, the infection rate. So how much once you've had the vaccine, or can you be a carrier of passing that virus on to other people who haven't been vaccinated yet? And that's the difference between the black and purple line is probably where we are, because we know in general, the Oxford vaccine has um, studies suggest it reduces the infection rate uh, by about 67%. So um, it's not entirely clear where we are, but it's somewhere between the black and pink line. And then on the right hand side, it's really just making this point that when we do come out of uh, lockdown, we need to gradually um, uh, open up the economy or gradually open up uh, the restrictions. If again, we want to sort of push uh, any increase uh, over the winter time. Um, so and I think that is certainly what I'm seeing businesses planning. They're trying to think about the range of scenarios. And I think it's also really important that our policy response are robust to that. A range of scenarios. So next slide, please. Um, so this is just showing, this is a, a survey of decision maker panels. So it's businesses across sectors uh, and how they see the impact of the pandemic over the next few quarters in terms of their overall sales. So we can see that um, businesses are expecting sales to recover, but it takes a while for us to get back to those pre-pandemic uh, levels. I mean, if we look at our own forecast for the UK economy um, uh, and what the Bank of England are, are saying, um, they expect to see an impact of the restrictions that we're seeing at the moment reduce overall GDP growth in Q1 by about 4%. Now, let's put that in context. That, that is a lot less than the almost 20% uh, contraction we saw in the, in the uh, spring lockdown in the economy in Q2. Um, thereafter, the Bank of England are expecting the economy uh, to bounce back quickly as we lift those restrictions. So they're expecting to see growth in the UK as a whole um, of about uh, of about five percent this year and seven and just over seven percent uh, next year. Um, and this is reflected. And I think what's really driving that is an increase in household spending. So can across the macro economy, consumers have built up savings. Uh, as those are spent, that will help to, to boost the economy. But one of the things this slide shows is the thing that is slower to come back is investment. Uh, and I think when we're trying to boost our economy over the long term, it's really important that we do what we can to help businesses invest. Um, and of course, one of the things that's holding investment back is just the uncertainty about how the pandemic 
uh, is impacting on us. Next slide, please. Um, this is just showing you how different sectors have been impacted. And um, what you can see is if you just focus on, on the dots, is obviously some, uh, if we would think back to where we were in spring, accommodation and food, that is essentially hotels, cafes, restaurants, really impacted uh, by the complete sort of closure of, of the economy. And actually they're a sector that even now uh, is still about 60% as of November, um, what they were sort of pre-pandemic um, levels. And the other sectors that have really been impacted is, is arts, entertainment, theatres, leisure centres, uh, and other services. Again, hairdressers, salons, things where you need to be face to face. Um, uh, but what we've seen more broadly is actually in, in construction who were initially very hit by the pandemic, they've managed to open up and uh, many of us have been using the opportunity to do up our homes and, and construction sites have really managed to open up and so they've sort of recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and one of the questions of course is where is, is digital and media and uh, uh, within all of these sectors and I think really it's uh, they are reflected in partly in professional services but many um, almost across these sectors there are digital uh, businesses that uh, are reflected in those sectors so next slide please um, and then and this is where I would just want to talk a little bit about what we think will stick uh, from uh, from this uh, pandemic and I think one of the things we absolutely know will is uh, is consumer behavior. So there's almost been a decade of change uh, in a few in a few weeks uh, during that first uh, pandemic. So uh, we saw a huge acceleration of a trend that was already there for people to sort of shop uh, online. Um, but it went from about a fifth of our overall spending uh, to almost a third. It settled back down a little bit uh, to about 30%, but that is something I think that is here with us uh, to stay. And you can see how um, the different components of spending have been affected by restrictions, but that online component is here to stay. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that is undoubtedly here to stay uh, is um, the impact of working from home. So uh, like many of you, I've been working from home uh, pretty consistently over the uh, pandemic. I think it's always helpful to remember it's it's that's really concentrated in uh, at least 40% of the economy where it's relatively easy to work from home. Of course, many uh, people in our supermarkets, in our frontline services uh, and across manufacturing and construction and many other industries have been going into work uh, on a daily basis. But what we have definitely seen is people are uh, working more from home and I'll come back to the sort of office space. So that's had a big impact on our uh, city centres. If you think about London, Birmingham, Manchester, affected by three big things, uh, less tourism, international tourism, uh, fewer students coming back or not being able to spend uh, and go out uh, into city centres when they are back at university, uh, and finally uh, fewer commuters. So that's affected the sort of city footfall uh, and what you can see is over the summer months, some of the city, smaller cities like Southampton, Norwich um, and even Cardiff or Belfast, uh, we actually did see an increase in city centre footfall because they benefited from domestic inbound tourism. So we could well see that in the summer. I know it's a really live issue. Are we allowed to, to go on? Will we be allowed to travel around the country in, in the summer? But I think as we emerge from the pandemic, I think we will see these smaller city centers uh, rebound much more quickly. I think it is gonna be hard, much harder for some of the larger city centers uh, to recover uh, initially. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, and what is absolutely true and another trend that will definitely stick is this working uh, from home. So we did a survey of businesses and what we found is most businesses on average expect to reduce their office space by about 20%. That may not sound quite dramatic, but if that is happening across uh, the whole economy, that will have a dramatic impact on our city centres and what they look like. And what we're finding is businesses are talking about repurposing uh, a lot of their office space. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, 
and this is a build slide, I really, uh, apologies, I should have probably made it as a snapshot. So, so go on, next slide, please, which will help this to build. So I think what we saw before is, is of course, in most uh, professional services, um, most people were generally in the office most of the time. There was some flexible working, but what we've seen is this trend has uh, absolutely accelerated. So next slide, please. And so when we ask businesses what they think will happen uh, in the future, what they expect is that the majority of us will be dividing our time uh, between the office and home uh, when we work in an industry where that's um, where it's possible to sort of work from home. Um, and of course, there's a huge digital parallel to that. And if I want, this is where I'm going to end on a bit more of an optimistic note. What we've seen is a huge amount of acceleration of digital adoption across businesses. So in that first wave of the pandemic, back in the spring, the LSE did a survey and found that over 60% of SMEs adopted a digital technology, uh, either a new one or invested more in some of the uh, formats they had already. Um, relative to, to before. So it, it really has accelerated digital uh, adoption. And I think that is something that is here, absolutely here to stay. And it's been an area where the UK has fallen behind other countries. Uh, so I think that's really positive for our growth and our productivity over the future. Next slide, please. Now, I think it may sound odd to say that I'm going to cheer you all up as I finish um, just by talking about climate change. Um, but I think one of the things, the huge transformation we're absolutely seeing uh, across the economy here in the UK uh, is around the transition to a low carbon economy. And two years ago, we adopted our net zero target. Uh, so that is now the law. Um, by 2050, we have committed to reducing our carbon emissions across uh, the economy. And that's the balanced pathway that the UK Committee on Climate Change uh, have set out. And one of the things I think is really important is if you look on the left chart on the left, that black line shows actually we've been hugely successful at reducing our carbon emissions. So I think we do need to get away from climate pessimism, the idea we can't do anything about it, because we've managed to transform our energy use to the point where almost 50% of our energy comes from renewable sources in the UK. And the UK has been a world leader in that. So we, uh, the development of offshore wind, of solar technologies has absolutely led that uh, transformation. But I think the next decade is going to be really tough. Reducing uh, emissions across sectors is going to take a lot of work from uh, businesses, from all of us. And, but it absolutely is possible. And if you move on to the next slide, please. Uh, what we need to do is think about our buildings, how we heat our homes. 40% um, uh, of emissions in the UK come from our buildings and 80% of those are commercial property. So there's a huge piece about how we make sure our buildings are much more energy efficient. Of course, it's about transportation uh, and how we move around uh, the country and the whole move to electric vehicles um, and sustainable aviation. And then, of course, thinking about where our energy use comes from. Uh, itself. And then there's also carbon capture usage and storage, where we're technologies that suck carbon out of the atmosphere, it can be as simple as a tree, uh, but there are much more sophisticated technologies that then either store that uh, or use it again. Uh, and the UK, again, is a world leader in that. And one of the things that is almost a golden thread through those transitions is digital adoption and, and technologies, whether that's thinking about smart cities, smart grids, uh, or thinking about how logistics work and making sure you're, you're reducing the number of um, uh, trips that, that lorries are taking. There's a huge role for digital adoption that really underpins that low carbon uh, transition. So finally, next slide, please. Um, and what I've really been heartened by throughout this pandemic is many people have said, you know, our business is pulling back on their commitment uh, to climate during this crisis. And I've found actually the reverse. Businesses are the ones who are really pushing government uh, to put the right policies in place to make this low carbon transition. And why is that? It's coming from their customers. It's coming from their clients. Uh, it's coming from those of us who are parents from the younger generation. And I think from what businesses themselves want to see. And they also see the opportunities. The UK is hosting the COP26 climate negotiations in November. We're leading the G7 uh, this year. And it's a huge opportunity for the UK to step forward 
uh, and show the progress we've made on tackling climate change uh, and really help lead the way. And it's the private sector that's really uh, aligning uh, on that. And I think as Mark Carney himself put it, uh, you know, someone who's normally measured with their words as a, uh, the governor of the Bank of England, you know, businesses that make this transition will be rewarded handsomely. And those who don't over uh, by 2050 will just cease to exist uh, because we have made this uh, commitment and because it's, it's an adaptation that we need to do uh, as a country and as a globe. So look, I'm going to pause there and, and hand back uh, over to you. I look forward to uh, some questions. Uh, I'm sure that's given you plenty of food for thought. And I think the shining beacons of light are absolutely the vaccine uh, deployment. Uh, and I hope that we use that to tackle some of the things we really need to see in our uh, economy over the long term. And tackling climate change is definitely at the heart of that. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was fascinating. <clears throat> really enjoyed that session. And um, I think it gives us a lot of encouragement, The just the appeal of digital, that it's a central thread running through so many of the um, you know, recovery-based conversations that, that I've been in over the last um, few months. And um, looking at low carbon as well, looking at the role for clean tech and smart cities businesses and uh, some of the great things that the UK smart cities businesses are starting to do around the world. Uh, we sponsor the Department for International Trades Tech Export Academy, and that's absolutely focused on smart cities businesses um, at the moment, looking at Southeast Asia. And, and just thinking about what some of those are achieving and can achieve is um, you know, it's actually really fascinating to me. Um, so thank you. Um, just so everyone, just remember the, the questions facility, please. We've got some questions coming through, that, that's great. And we'll look to pick them up uh, later on. Uh, but I'm now gonna hand over to Paul and to Derek, um, really just to talk through uh, in some, some more detail what they're seeing out in the marketplace with the tech and the media businesses that they're talking to and, uh, and the sorts of places that they are heading in their transactions. So uh, thanks, Paul and Derek and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Tony, and morning, everyone. Yeah, so Derek and I um, are just gonna pick this up from a tech and media uh, M&A and due diligence standpoint, and really just quite quickly go over last year, because it's it's slightly old news now, and being in lockdown is, uh, is nothing new to anyone anymore. Uh, but more interestingly, probably uh, look forward to what we see is happening in, in the rest of 21. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and I will also try and bring this to life for you with what it actually meant to the companies that were executing transactions at this time and how anyone planning a transaction might respond. Next slide, please, Kathleen. Um, you'll have seen charts like this before down to the right. Um, I wonder how well we all remember this time last year. It was starting to feel real on many levels. Um, my son gave us an early glimpse of lockdown by developing a cough. Um, cities were getting quieter and quieter, and I remember debating whether to go into the office. And over a number of weeks in February and March, many deals just stopped. Private equity houses and corporates were focused on reacting to the crisis, on securing their businesses, and on the well-being of their people. And what, what was surprising from that was just how quickly it came back. And we've used the NASDAQ here as just the barometer for tech. Um, and it, it, it really started coming back from early April. And by June, it was at the level it was in early January, which you know was a, a, an early indicator of uh, what we were going to see. And we started to see that in um, our world, certainly by mid-June onwards, deals that had just been paused and stopped in the middle of March started to complete, which is really the first sign of, uh, of what, what was going to come for the rest of the year. And it was interesting that the US seemed to be one of the places that recovered first. Our colleagues in the States um, stayed pretty busy, including making some acquisitions in the UK. And I don't know whether that says something about their risk appetite or their visibility on the, the crisis, uh, but they were definitely active. Um, the, the next uh, 
group to come back into the M&A market was really private equity back trade, the buy and build strategies. And I think you can rationalize that because investors were backing their known management teams. So making the deals arguably less risky. Uh, and then finally, the, the PE platform deals, these are the deals to back a management team to execute a strategy. They came back and quite unusually, we saw quite a few sale processes launched in the summer. And again, I think you can rationalize that because whilst in other years, we might have all been on holiday. Um, last year, you'll remember that we weren't. So it was a really, it was, it was a very quick turnaround in, in, in probably early April, Derek and I were getting calls saying things are going to be distressed. We've, we're happy to back our portfolio companies to buy them for sort of snap, you know, very cheap prices. That changed really, really quickly, <laughs> as I say, by June to, okay, you know, we actually, we think this is a good time to be investing in new platforms again. And we understand that we have to pay full prices and the, and the reasons for this are obviously well rehearsed and rain mentioned several times digital tech work from home well of course all of the companies that we're talking about in this sector make all of this possible so with some sectors just being impossible to invest in from a a, a general PE fund point of view hospitality leisure travel etc have all been quite big recipients of uh investment over the last few years when that stops clearly there's a flight there's an instant switch to tech and it became quite clear as well again by the sort of back end of the summer that the tech businesses were doing quite well so you had a sort of double whammy effect of people wanting to invest in tech and the tech businesses doing well because they're repairing everyone's remote working environments and, that, and other things we'll talk about a bit later So this chart looks at deal activity by quarter across 2019 and 2020. Um, the contrast between Q2 2020 and Q2 2019 is, is clear. Um, private equity deals almost stopped and, and trade slowed down. In this chart, trade includes private equity backed companies, the bolt-ons, the buy and builds that we, we talked about before. Um, and the recovery in Q2, Q3 is also clear. Um, private equity is making up for lost time. Um, remember, these funds have a fixed life and any periods where they are not investing costs them time and money. So there was a real impetus to, to get back out there. And then if, if, if we look at pricing, um, particularly focus on the PE bars there, the inevitable reduction in prices in Q2 with the lower deal volumes is entirely logical. But what, what really few people would have been able to predict is the way that the prices then increase. And it's, it's, uh, it is, it's obvious with hindsight, with all that extra dry powder chasing a limited stock of investable tech assets, then the prices had to go up. Trade prices, just, you know, trade prices are trade prices. We'll talk about that a bit later but PE uh, there's a much more sort of fluid pricing environment with the scarcity value of the of the assets and again you know why did that happen well it was definitely the double impact that there was more money chasing these businesses but the businesses were, were performing very strongly so Derek and I doing our our jobs in the field you know you're able to forecast with certainty um, companies that initially thought they wouldn't achieve their budgets uh, that were set pre-COVID suddenly were run rating at levels that said they could. So, so it was, uh, it, it became a very attractive in, environment. I mean, what then happened, which again, if you'd have said to Derek and I in March, this is going to happen by October, November, we'd have, we'd have said just absolutely no chance is the market got incredibly hot and you can see the spike in Q4 prices uh, there with PE getting up to 10. And so the process became very aggressive. There's a lot of preempting uh, bids. There were processes where um, businesses were meant to become the market and then suddenly uh, got announced that they'd been completed by someone who'd been tracking it for a while. So it went from no one really knowing what was going on to incredibly frothy in a short period of time. 
And this was happening very much in, in our market in the, these mid-sized deals. This chart shows pricing by deal size. Now, you expect to see higher pricing for, for larger deals, not least sizes offering a proxy for resilience. Um, and the, the trade and sub 20 million deal values showed this expected size discount. But that middle bar, the, the 20 to 75 million range, the PE pricing was actually similar to larger deals. And it just shows the impact of the switch of all of that private equity dry powder, those uninvested funds to tech. The demand for deals outweighed the supply of good quality investable businesses and prices rose accordingly. And in 2020, we saw all variations of the deals we've talked about. There's cross-border, there's the private equity bolt-on and the private equity platform, the listed and the private trade. And we, and you know, obviously to say, but come mid-March, we were wondering whether that was the end of our 2020. There would have been uh, not many logos on this sheet at all, but, but you know, it just, it turned out to be an extremely busy year. So <clears throat> that's kind of 2020. I think, I think everyone's familiar with that trend. You know, you guys who own businesses, I'm sure you noticed by the summer, we're, we're probably getting LinkedIn messages like crazy from uh, M&A advisors and PE directs. So you, you could sense what was going on in the market. So what we want to do is just sort of tell you from what, where, what we're seeing now and a bit of a prediction. And some of these things, you know, fintech, SaaS, edtech, uh, obviously has, has got a boost with home learning, ad tech, cyber, they've been hot areas for years. So we could have done this slide for the last five years and put them on. And, you know, there's a, I'm sure a lot of you, you guys involved in this in terms of clever tech, updating legacy operating models and system. So what we thought we'd concentrate on are the things that really have, we've really started to see come to the fore more digital transformation uh is the new you know buzzword um that i'm sure all the private equity guys are seeing everyone write write it all over their information memorandums because uh it seems to attract premium at the minute but it's pretty obvious again that as rain said with this what is definitely a permanent shift in the way people work it's meant that companies now are uh, are accelerating their cloud adoption strategies so things that might have been on a three, four, five year IT rollout program, I mean, you just do it now because you haven't got people coming into a building where you've got the, uh, the, the tech is in the basement of the building, but everyone's at home. So you may as well just adopt the cloud quickly. So um, we've definitely seen that. And then, and of course, you then create a little loop because that puts more pressure on people's cyber investment so cyber has been an area where people have been trying to catch up if you then accelerate the adoption to the cloud and, and people are remote working it puts even more stress on the cyber so we've seen cyber has gone from a cto's agenda point to a to a ceo's agenda point definitely and you, i think you see a similar trend similar drivers supporting it managed services services businesses which continue to be in demand they're they're robust businesses they're critical spend for for many companies with recurring revenues and, and good cash generation uh, and they're a great place for a private equity buy and build where revenue and cost synergies can be generated and, and you could start to see the multiple arbitrage that we saw with valuations rising for, for larger businesses earlier. And um, we worked on three last year, Focus, Babel and, and Acora. Um, and the, the buy and build strategies can involve focusing on a uh, sector, a geography, a size of clients, um, and Charterhouse, a previous client of, of Paul's and mine, um, acquired cyber capability, which uh, again links to Paul's point and, and shows how managed services companies are looking to broaden out their capabilities and, and cross-sell services to their existing customers. And again, picking up one of the one of the hot areas, it's been a hot area for years, SaaS software, you know, SaaS adaption adoption um we have seen a change uh we've we've seen a change in that this wall of money chasing tech has meant that for the first time we're seeing mid-market uk pe 
um, happy to invest in businesses on a on a you know on an ARR multiple valuation basis that might be still loss making you know w- without generating any EBITDA. So so even in the old cross areas, there's there's things going on. Do we, we we've put ESG on this as a as something to think about going forward. I mean, Rain's obviously talked about the climate aspect, one aspect of ESG. I mean, clearly ESG is here now. Um, it will it will affect your businesses, all our businesses, our businesses. It will definitely affect investment processes because if you cannot tick an ESG due diligence type checklist, you're you're, you're unlikely to receive investment in our view. But of course, for for you guys, it's uh, it must be a great opportunity because to provide ESG type compliant services, most of those solutions we think are going to be tech. So we would expect to see a lot of uh, ESG type tech coming to the fore over the next year or two. So, um, you know, what do we, this is kind of Derek and me scratching our heads thinking, well, what on a daily basis, what are people saying to us? What were they saying to us? How does it change? And, and of course, have we met the management team face to face? I mean, that was very much a sort of first half of 20 points. And I mean, I got told by several private equity houses, there's an absolute red line for us. We will not complete a deal if we haven't met people face to face. Well, guess what? By the end of the year, given the wall of money chasing everything, then deals were happening that were completely virtual. You know, people hadn't met anyone. No one knew what anyone looked at, looked like below the shoulder level, whether whether your your person, your CEO, your backing is five foot two or six foot ten was a complete mystery. So that one got now, I mean we think it will go back to how it was. So I wouldn't recommend chucking all your suits away just yet. It's obviously a lot easier if you can meet people face to face. And then the other the other the other big thing was the emergence of EBIT DAC. So uh, let's add a COVID adjustment to the other adjustment. And of course there was a lot of talk about that again in the in the in the summer. It it disappeared really quickly. I think because the businesses were doing you know were, were starting to run rate at their previous rates. So it became a bit irrelevant in a way. But having said that it was really important. It is really important to be able to explain the diff, you know, what happened with the COVID adjustment and clearly use it as a reference point when you're predicting forward um, for the future. EBIT that pretty much comes up as a, a point for discussion in all of the diligence that I do, but as, as Paul says, it often falls away pretty quickly. And sadly, it means I won't make a million from server on the EBIT DAC mugs and t-shirts that I ordered in April. Um, a, another feature of the market, Paul's talked about the, the level of demand for, for transactions and uh, it, it, was, it was noticed and lots of companies decided to accelerate processes or even start processes perhaps that they hadn't been thinking of um, to sell. Um, the uh, rumours around a capital gains tax environment becoming less favourable in the March budget, I think also uh, pushed a lot of entrepreneurs to, to think about a transaction. So there was a, a hell of a lot of information around memoranda landing on the desks of private equity houses, and they're, they're not big businesses in the main. Um, so we were hearing from, from them and from corporates that they were getting congested with opportunities and they were having to choose which ones to spend time on. Um, now, not all of these deals did get done and, and will get done. The time pressure and any hint of a lack of preparedness often results in compromises, whether that's on, on price, on other terms, or, or perhaps um, meaning the deal won't get done. Um, it's not good often to have a failed process. So I, I think that our advice is to look through this this short term stuff um, and to go at the right time for for you and your business rather than necessarily being driven by a, a rumor of capital gains tax rise. Um, Colombo diligence. Um, this is not the other T-shirt available from the, the BDO website. 
Um, so as prices rise, the level of diligence rises. When you're paying up for an asset, you feel exposed. And if you overlay the current levels of uncertainty, then we were finding in diligence that there was always one more thing. Um, current trading, pipeline, visibility of outturn, just constant updates required. And a sale process is all about confidence. Um, where bad news comes out during a process, then confidence is damaged. So um, I, I think whilst you might think that lots of demand, easy time to get a deal done, actually what we were seeing was it was the carefully planned, well-run, competitive processes supported by vendor due diligence um, so that all parties were bidding off the same diligence information. Those were the ones that were really achieving some of the amazing pricing that, that we talked about earlier. Um, so I think, you know, stick to good practice um, is the message. Um, uh, uh, now, another feature of, of a high level of pricing is that investors inevitably look for other ways to, to reduce the price, which is where these adjustments to, to equity value come in, the EV bridge. Um, this is the idea that for the same business, there's a higher equity value for a business that has cash on the balance sheet rather than a business with debt. Um, and buyers were also using working capital adjustments, the idea that a business is sold with a normal level of working capital to drive value. Now, sadly, uh, there is no textbook definition of cash, debt, or working capital, and there are plenty of gray areas to be exploited, exploited, sorry, not least um, whether 2020 was a normal year and um, can history be used to inform the future. And there are some new balance sheet items as well um, that have to be considered. Things like C-bills, tax deferral, furlough. And it's especially difficult to form a view on some of these items. There's the objective issue of, of what's on the balance sheet and whether any particular government support was validly claimed. But the, the new moral dimension that perhaps if a business can afford to repay the support, then perhaps it should. So a, again, our advice is to use the, the process, use the competitive tension to get value here. So um, provide bidders with a reasonable view of the enterprise equity value bridge and get them to confirm their views while there's competitive tension in the process and before they're offered exclusivity. And it, just one thing to pick up there, that again, Derek and I see a lot of it, with a sort of frothy market as we've described in the autumn in particular, lots of preempting processes so processes information memoranda don't get written there's no time it's tempting to think that you don't need to have uh, all of the information to complete a deal and that's just completely wrong because the businesses that are able to achieve the premium skip through diligence receive a preemptive bid are the ones that are ahead of the game so the key to it is to have your kpi you know your data absolutely in good shape and we spend a lot of time talking to people about what that looks like working capital stats will enable you to battle off the inevitable um conversation difficult conversation around the equity bridge and it's obvious things like uh like your financial performance but also there's some qualitative aspects as well that that we, we encourage people to put in kpis like pipeline tracking you know key people in the business, et cetera, et cetera. So if you've got that data ready and you're collating it every month, you're in a far better place to then be able to move and, and uh, respond to something that comes in at you. And aside from my stockpile of EBITDA mugs and, mugs and t-shirts, the other thing that, that I got wrong was I really expected to see earnouts. So given the uncertainty, we might have expected to see earnouts used to bridge any expectations gaps around the projections and to de-risk the, the position of the buyers. Which, which, which I, I think it's logical we didn't, given the given the dry powder argument that you know when you're negotiating with such a strong hand, people might ask for earnouts, but you can back them off quite easily. Anyway, that's um, that's it for Derek and I. I hope that was informative. Uh, obviously, I hand back to Tony for the Q and A. Many thanks, Paul and Derek. A um, couple, couple of questions about your um, choice of angle grinder and foot spa this morning on the background, but uh, 
thankfully more questions about uh, other things. So um, we'll move on to Q&A now and uh, because um, we've all got a bit of background noise, let's be careful with our mute buttons. Um, the first question that actually has come across a lot in different formats is um, whether we're kind of approaching the final stages of a, of a tech bubble. And I think from what I'm seeing, we're, we're sort of approaching the end of the beginning, I think. If we look at all of the um, forces out there that are going, going to encourage further digitalization, um, further acceleration of uh, this trend and, uh, and the way in which COVID has been a, a real catalyst for digitalization, I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're almost just at the start. I can see why some people have, um, have said that because uh, you know, there rarely a day goes by without a, a story about some sort of horrific capital gains tax rate that we're apparently all going to be paying um, after the 3rd of March. But um, certainly the, the transactions I'm advising from a tax perspective, um, yes, if there is a transaction that can be done by the 3rd of March, um, it's being done by the 3rd of March. But there's also a pretty strong pipeline of, um, of transactions and just generally good business decisions that, that are going to follow throughout the rest of the year. So, um, Paul, do you want to pick up on whether, um, on sort of what, how you see that, that this tech bubble? I mean, I, I can see bubbling in certain areas, certain subsectors, and certain companies because there's always going to be the next uh, <laughs> the next GameStop. But um, yeah, how, how do you see it in terms of this uh, this bubbling um, uh, feature? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's become a it's a lot of sort of news on it, isn't there? That this is, there's this sort of at first glance slightly scary notion you read about the big investment funds are switching from you know US Treasury bills into big tech um, to to generate a return, which at first glance you think, wow, that 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 that, that does sound a bit scary. And and you can you know any day you could pick up an IPO on Nasdaq where a business that seemingly doesn't have any profit, any any revenue is is floating at a crazy price. So there's a, the, at that level, there's a big debate going on. Um, you know, everyone can read the articles and take a bit of a view. In certainly in bringing it down to our world, yes, prices did go up in the autumn, as we've demonstrated just now on the slides. A function of, as I say, tech business is doing well some sectors being uninvestable and and again as rain said a switch in business models that mean that tech companies are going to be to the to the fore is it a bubble i think prices prices have have definitely gone up um will they go down well it's hard to see them go going down significantly for as long as those market dynamics are there you know we are living in a world we have been for several years of kind of ubiquitous liquidity. There, there, there is a lot of money chasing these businesses and the businesses are relatively scarce because you have to get to a certain stage to, to, to be able to receive investment. So for as long as that market dynamic is there, I don't think uh, the prices we're seeing in the mid market will go down. I don't see them going up significantly from where they got to in the autumn, I think they've got to a point where it's difficult to see how they will increase significantly, in my view. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. We've, we've had a, also a number of questions on our old friend Brexit. Um, and um, really, uh, the questions have focused on the, the likely longer term impacts on, on both the economy and um, volumes of transactions. Um, particularly looking at um, inbound investment in UK tech and, and some sort of specific questions also around the, uh, the way in which we've had the changes in the v VAT treatment on uh, tech businesses uh, trading in the EU and, and whether just things like that are going to have an impact on SMEs trading. And uh, I wonder if, uh, Rain, you could um, you know, give, give some thoughts on, on how you see um, Brexit, the post-Brexit um, panning out, uh, just in terms of future trade in, in services and in tech in particular. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Tony. And, and uh, I did I did very well, I think, to get through a presentation on, on the UK economic outlook uh, without mentioning uh, Brexit, which was probably remiss of me. But um, look, I think, first of all, getting that the deal that we have so far uh, over the line was was hugely um, important. I think just not having that uncertainty hanging over uh, businesses is, you know, is vital and um, and certainly having tariff free uh, trade really important for our manufacturing sectors. Uh, but I think, look, there are still, a, a, you know, many challenges ahead and lots of things that still need to be sorted. The The deal we do have is relatively thin. It's mainly uh, focused on goods and there's still a lot of um, things that are unwritten, uh, if you like, about how we will trade in, in services. So, um, and first and foremost at, at the moment, and we heard Andrew Bailey uh, expressing his concerns in the media this morning about our ability to to get sort of equivalents on on financial services. There's a, a deal that's uh, on financial services that's due to be done uh, by the end of of March. Um, and I think on on sort of tech, obviously that really depends on uh, rules around data ad adequacy. And I think the other bit that's important is around recognition of, of professional qualifications. Because it it feels a long way away at, at the moment, but there's still a uh, you know, the importance of people moving uh, across borders and being able to uh, provide advice both in uh, the UK market, but but also in European countries. So I think some of that is still to be uh, determined through uh, the trade facilitation, uh, you know, agreements over, over the coming months. So I think where that ends up will be important. Um, I think there's a sort of wider piece stepping back almost, you know, now we are uh, free to sort of set our own uh, regulations is what sort of path will the UK take and that will determine uh, you know where we want to position ourselves you can think broadly we can either align uh, a regulatory framework around digital attack on a sort of US model or you can look to the European model and uh, and the truth is the UK often um, sits in the middle and and um, so it does depend you know what sort of path uh, we forge around that. And then I, I think the final bit is also around uh, I immigration and, and being sort of open um, uh, to talent from around the world. Um, and I think on that, you know, the, the you know, our, our determination on immigration is, is still being uh, developed, but does the UK stay open to talent from around the world, not just from Europe, I think will be important because what we do know is that tech professional services are, are very much a people driven uh, business. So so having the ability to draw in talent from around the world is really important for how we uh, trade in in services. So um, but I think I would just sort of end, though, by saying I think, you know, um, uh, one of the things, you know, the UK is still a, an attraction for talent around tech and fintech. And there are lots of sectors where we are still very world leading. Um, and I think that will continue post Brexit, but how much we we make of that will really determine uh, will really be determined not only by how some of those future negotiations go with the EU, but but also what sort of path we we forge around the regulatory uh, environment to facilitate uh, that trade and that industry. And Tony, just oh, to, to build yeah, Derek, on, just, yeah. So on the ground, what it felt like. Um, so after the vote, we. We found that overseas investors did struggle a bit with the complexity and the uncertainty initially, but then it came back strongly when it was perceived, I think, that nothing had really happened. Um, the, the pandemic has made it difficult to isolate any impact in 2020, um, and I think we are still learning. So tariff and quota-free trade in goods hasn't removed friction. Um, whether it's exporting sausage meat or importing roses and um, this paperwork and it, in services as Rain said there's, there's still a lack of clarity um, but there is more admin around data protection, mobile roaming, movement of workers um, but uh, overall I think you know the question was about the long term and the UK tech and media sector is nothing if it's not adaptable and resilient um, the infrastructure and the ecosystem for supporting tech in the UK remains relatively strong. So I'd expect that we will remain a, an attractive place to, to do business. And um, I, I think that, as Rain said, that the government strategy on this will be will be absolutely critical for the longer term. What do they want the UK economy to, to look like? But I think that the tech and media sector will adapt accordingly. 
Thanks, Derek. Um, so the next set of questions is around funding environment. And um, that's um, quite a lot of questions actually around tax as well. And um, so uh, I'll sort of muse on that a little bit, um, but do bear in mind that uh, doing tax for a living sometimes means you see the world slightly upside down. Um, I think the, uh, if we look at really, really important things like EIS, you know, are they straightforward? <laughs> no. Um, are they reasonably generous? Yes. Uh, could they be improved? Definitely. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how the whole kind of friction between what we want to do to power up scale ups versus what we feel like we're able to do against the background of uh, the EU state aid rules um, having um, dictated to us for, for, for so long. Um, it would be really interesting to see where we could get to on things like EIS, things like research and development tax credits, where we've made huge, huge steps. And that, uh, that relief's only been with us for 20 years. Um, whether we can revitalize things like the patent box for, uh, for tax, and also our old friend Entrepreneurs Relief, which, um, which is no longer called Entrepreneurs Relief. It's called Business Asset Disposal Relief, um, or uh, to abbreviate it, BAD Relief. And it only applies to £1 million worth of gains, whereas Investors Relief, which is more for to the sort of angel investors, still applies to £10 million of gains. So there, there's something there that just doesn't feel quite right at the moment. Um, there's something within the 20% general rate of capital gains that also probably doesn't feel right to a whole other group of people. So I think that in terms of the funding environment and looking at how tax has a part in that, we definitely haven't got a finished article yet of a coherent regime. We definitely haven't got something that encourages people to put money in, um, keep putting money in and, and leave it there and, uh, and come out with, with a good result. So uh, bearing in mind the, the, the amount of risk they're taking. So I do see uh, the tax aspects of the funding environment um, in need of change. Um, Raina, I don't know if there's anything sort of more generally in terms of economics and the, uh, the UK economy where, where you think that we could do more for uh, the, the scale up community. Yeah, I mean, look, I think in, in the, the UK, generally, we have been, we're relatively good on, on sort of startups and, and that initial business incubation phase, but, but where we sort of challenges is over that medium term funding that three to five year and particularly when businesses are coming back for that next stage of, of growth there's not a we don't have the sort of depth of venture capital markets that you have uh, in in the US uh, for instance so we do do better than some of our European peers um, around that so I think it is really important uh, to, to grow that I think if you think about the taxation landscape absolutely agree with what you were saying around the r d tax credit i think that's something that we're recognized you know globally as as having a an efficient tax credit for r d which does help to promote uh research and and development but i think there are still changes that could be made to make that more uh, fit for a changing uh, economy so thinking about the role of data innovations which is often where uh you know a lot of r d investment is now being made and making that that credit apply to uh, some of those newer types of business models, I think is something we should definitely uh, look at. Um, uh, I mean, I'm happy as well to sort of talk about the wider uh, fiscal picture, but I, I don't know if that was something you wanted me to, to cover at, at this stage. I think it would be interesting if, if you could, yeah, yeah, briefly. Yeah, so, I mean, look, the, um, uh, I mean, obviously, there's been a you know a lot of speculation. We we have uh, seen an increase, a huge increase in, in government borrowing, uh, necessarily to uh, address the the pandemic. And you know, overall, we've spent you know upwards of, of 200 billion uh, pounds. Uh, you know, some of that has obviously been on our healthcare services. Uh, a large proportion has been around the job retention scheme, which has been so important in uh, preserving jobs and, and in supporting people in employment. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why when you look at the US, unemployment there spiked, you know, into double digits. Um, 
whereas here in the UK, unemployment is rising, uh, but it's still relatively low, around uh, 5%. And I think, you know, it's still likely to rise to about 7%, particularly as, you know, we think the, the job retention scheme needs to be in place for a bit longer, certainly till uh, the summer and then taper off uh, after that. Uh, but we will see a rise in, in unemployment. So, um, and I think those policies have been really necessary to help businesses through uh, the pandemic. But going forward, where does that leave us in terms of the public finances and, and taxation? Well, you can't run uh, deficits that are in sort of double digits uh, forever. Um, but the way for us to focus on that is absolutely to tackle growth and to get our economy uh, growing again. There's been actually a huge economic consensus that you know, now is not the moment for austerity or, or for tax rises, that you need to wait at least a year post the trough of your uh, of the impact on the economy before you even think about uh, what needs to happen. And I think the other thing that's really important to bear in mind in, in the UK is actually, yes, the overall level of government debt has gone up. It's now uh, close to 105 percent of, of GDP. But actually, the increase in government debt hasn't been that it, was, it didn't go up as much uh, as we saw post the global financial crisis. And because interest rates are so low and they will stay low for a very long time, uh, there's structural reasons for that. And, and also, uh, we know from indications from, from the Bank of England, they're likely to stay low at um, near zero for at least a couple of years. And in fact, the Bank of England is considering uh, operationally whether they might want to pursue negative interest rates, the cost of serving that debt is really is still really low. And actually, the overall cost of servicing the debt hasn't gone up that much um, in, in recent years. So we can tolerate that higher level of debt. But over the medium term, we need to make sure it's not on a accelerating uh, path. But I think to my mind, we need to focus on on growth. We're not going to need to see the kind of austerity in terms of like uh, cutting back on government department spending that we saw after the global uh, financial crisis, because as the economy starts to grow, you know, the furlough scheme, even if it were kept running, uh, what we're seeing is fewer and fewer businesses are using it. Um, uh, but over the me very medium term, do we need to look at the wider set of of taxation? Yes, we probably do. And it's not always popular, but over that very medium term, we might need to see some increases in uh, areas of taxation. But I think what we want to see the government do is to consult properly on that and to do it gradually and uh, and over time. We know, for instance, for example, fuel duty uh, is a tax that is going to need to come to an end because it's related to petrol, to, to combustible engines, and the government's committed to moving away from that. Um, so over the medium term, we need to think about a different model uh, for raising a taxation uh, from from cars and transport. So what, what we'd need the government to do is to consult on how you do that well uh, and, and set out a corporation tax roadmap so businesses know uh, what, to, uh, what to expect. But obviously now it is the time to still focus on, uh, on growth and on uh, saving as many businesses through uh, what is still gonna be a, a pretty tough few weeks. Thanks, completely agree <laughs> with what I said. We've had a few questions on whether um, governments may try to sort of inflate their way out of COVID debt. But I think from what you're saying, that um, even if they could, uh, that that would seem um, unlikely at the moment. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I don't, I mean, in the latest Bank of England uh, report, I think you do see that, and this is where I don't, you know, there's a question as to whether they will pursue negative interest rates, what they've said is uh, they'll be prepared to operationalize that. So we've, they've told the financial sector to get ready uh, for them to use that should um, if they need to. But actually, if you look at the report, inflation does start to come up above 2%. So I think we're unlikely to see if growth is as strong as the Bank of England are hoping. So over 5% and then this year and 7% next year, uh, I don't think we'll see interest rate, we'll see them pursue negative uh, interest rates. Um, but equally, it's clear that we're not probably not going to see a big increase in interest rates. And while inflation is picking up, I, I am much less concerned about inflation sort of really taking off. And I think we're lucky we have an independent Bank of Eng England, um, independent from, from the Treasury. So their job is absolutely to tackle 
uh, inflation. So, uh, you know, the government may want at some point to inflate away the debt, but I think the Bank of England uh, would take a pretty dim view on that. Where you have seen coordination between the Bank of England and Treasury is just facilitating in, in markets the increase in overall uh, government debt. But I think the Bank of England uh, will definitely make sure that inflation uh, doesn't get out of control. Uh, and, and in my sense, we're still going to see challenges around uh, growth and, and, and uh, there are more risks on that side, I think, over the next year or two than there are uh, on inflation. Thanks. Great. Um, I've, I've only really got time for one, maybe one final question, maybe two, but I want to go back to Paul and Derek and um, just dwell on those slides around um, valuations and uh, the private equity valuations um, sort of recovered, um, overtook, the multiples overtook the um, trade valuations. And it's quite clear that in the mid-market where I think most of the people on this uh, call are, are um, focusing, uh, that the private equity is now ahead. But does this mean that you, um, you, know, that you would sort of run a, a PE only um, track or, or, or what, what's the thinking in terms of how you would then uh, you know, respond to the way in which the PE wall of money, which we've heard about for so long, uh, is is now focusing on on tech. How, how do you um, how do you sort of deal with that in uh, in practice, Paul? Do you want to go first on that? Yeah, I mean, it, what track you follow will obviously depend on what the client shareholders directors are trying to achieve. Sometimes people want to do a PE only deal, so we go and talk to PE people. Sometimes people don't want to do a PE deal. We talk straight, but. Generally, you'll talk to both. It, it is a bit of a conundrum, you know, when people come into the team, you know, they're, uh, they've done their, they're very bright people, they've done their economics degrees and, you know, they come in with the, well, obviously trade will always outbid PE, won't they? Because they can get the benefit of all the synergy. You say, well, yes, in theory, but it never actually pans out. It hasn't panned out like that because private equity guys, because of the wall of money, have just frankly had to sort of, sit with some valuations in some processes that the trade won't get to so and i cannot i just can't see how that would change for as long as we've got this situation of sort of unlimited liquidity in the private equity market having said that you you do see trade acquiring you know if you look at the look at go back to nasdaq look at tech we we we've sold we sold a business to a nasdaq listed company last year so as an M&A advisor, if the, if the brief is you know, fairly common, well, we want to achieve as much as we can, you always want to talk to trade because if you can find the trade where the strategy is there, they will, again, you know, throw the sort of rule book out the window a bit and you can get them to really, really stretch where, where they're convinced it's a big strategic move for them. And I think the other nuance is that private equity backed trade muddies the, the water a, a little bit where you've got both a synergy opportunity and uh, an opportunity for some of that dry powder to be to be put to work. Um, I, I think there are some um, entrepreneurs who, who think there's perhaps the, the perfect trade investor sitting in, in Asia or in the, the US that will pay an enormous amount of, of money. Um, sometimes that might be true. Sometimes it, it might be a bit of fake news. But um, I, I agree with Paul. I, I don't see the, 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 the un fundamental supply and demand drivers, um, of course, my economics degree, um, changing. Thanks, Derek. I'm, I'm keeping my economics degree quiet with rain on the line. Um, and it was joint with geography anyway, so it doesn't really count. Um, so, um, Rain, what, one final, actually, one final, final question, Colombo style, um, which is coming from a couple of the panelists, coming from a couple of the attendees during this, is uh, a kind of um, yes or no answer in a sort of true Piers Morgan way. Uh, will the main rate of capital gains tax go up on the 3rd of March? What, what, what do you think? We haven't rehearsed this, by the way. <laughs> no, I know. And I did see that question in uh, in the chat. I'm going to try and be good and give a yes or no answer. I'm going to say no. Uh, but do I think there's a risk? Am I worried? What are my anxieties on, on tax around the budget is yes, that CGT might go up. Uh, and I think also potentially corporation uh, tax as well. We've seen some speculation 
on that. What would I like to see? I think now, as I said before, now is not the time for tax rises. And I think as an economist, I think there's such a clear you know, view that, that we need to get growth going before you start thinking about uh, tax rises. So it just, it really just isn't the right time. And as we've seen, it is affect, the speculation around it is, a, is affecting investment decisions. And, um, and that's a real challenge. I mean, part of the reason why it came about was because of the report from the Office of Tax mm -hmm. Simplification, which was looking at sort of better alignment over uh, the medium term. But that office doesn't make projections on policy. They're just looking at you know that so look over the medium term are there things that could be done to simplify our tax system uh yes but i really hope that they don't increase um capital gains tax at this budget because i don't think um now is is the moment to to be looking at at changes and i don't think business you know businesses are dealing with so much whether that's brexit and what smes are dealing with who aren't used to dealing with rules of origin at, at the border or whether it's really you know shifting to these changing scenarios and and focusing on on saving as many jobs as possible, keeping their business uh, operational and adopting new uh, technologies. So uh, I think we need to get this uh, recovery really established before we start thinking about major changes to, to taxation. Yes, they can start doing some consultations on areas they, they might look at in the future, but I really hope they don't. But um, am I anxious about it? Yes, but I'm going to say that no, they won't. Yeah, I have a similar anxiousness about it. I have an anxiousness about there being a 28% rate for residential property and carried interest and whether that could become the, the, the unified uh, main rate. Um, I, I definitely can't see it raising a whole lot of money if it goes from 20 to 28%, but I can see it being an extremely sore piece of news to take for a lot of people on this call. So. Uh, I think um, you know, there, there is a worry in my mind as well that it would go up for pure political reasons rather than uh, anything else. So, uh, um, Tony, our, our usual ad advanced guidance on this sort of thing of chatting to a taxi driver around Westminster obviously isn't available at the moment, but the, the, right. the government has got history of, of leaking these things in advance. And uh, I don't know whether it's surprising or not that we, we haven't heard more about what might be in the budget. Yeah, it, it all points to me that if it's going up, it's going up on the budget day rather than on the 5th of April, because otherwise there will be 30 plus days of um, relative chaos. So uh, I think uh, that, that that's more that's likely to be uh, the one prediction I would make. Um, right. Well, that, that brings us to the end of uh, this morning. I hope everyone on the line enjoyed it. We had close to 200 people um, you know, for the main body of the presentations. and. Uh, that's at least 80 more than we could have had in our auditorium. So, so that's a good thing. The, the bad thing, however, is that we can't all stay around for, uh, for cups of tea and, and coffees and discussions afterwards. But what we will do is um, I'll send you a follow up email um, tomorrow, which will give all of our contact details. We'd, we'd love to have further conversations. Um, in addition to that, please feel free to visit our tech content hub where you'll find all sorts of information relevant uh, to, to your businesses. Plugged in, P-L-U-G-D colon I-N, naturally. Um, Google that. Uh, you'll find some really good, uh, really good stuff on there. Um, our next seminars are on the 4th of March, um, my birthday, uh, which is covering the budget. And then also on the 23rd of March, um, our head of tech globally from um, Silicon Valley, Aftab Jamil, is going to run a session on what US tech sector CFOs are seeing in their markets. He's going to run that for the whole of the European markets and registration details for both of those will be on the follow up email that you'll get after this. So I have um, two more things to say. Firstly, that we'll be, to confirm we'll be sending off the slides to you tomorrow. And secondly, a massive thank you. Uh, a really massive thank you to Rain for giving a, a great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed uh, listening to that and what you had to say in the Q&A. Uh, thanks as always to Paul and Derek for, for working, uh, for putting up with me, working alongside me and uh, working on some such uh, interesting deals uh, over the last year with, with plenty more to come. And a big thank you to Cathy Ann Hernandez, um, Georgia Weatherill and Ashley Halliday, who have actually put all of this together made it all work, uh, kept the cat filters away and uh, kept us all at time. So thank you very much. Um, stay safe, stay well, 
and look forward to catching up with you, maybe even face-to-face -face later on this year. Thank you.